Uh, so Nick told me how to introduce himself. So for people who do not know me, I'm Joel. I'm a scientist. So yes, mainly located in the Lisa building. I'm going to be using it. No risk. I don't know. Sorry. Louder. Oh dear. I will lose my voice. I was at a concert last night, so we see how this goes. There is a microphone. We can use that if you would like. Yeah. I should use my phone. Right, I'm gonna clip this on me. All right, is that better? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so yeah, I'm Jules, I work at CNS, and today I am gonna give a talk which has a slightly different title to what I was originally pr proposing. Um, so this was meant to be the second TM talk that we have, um, but that one got kind of rescheduled and we, we readjusted the schedule. So um, since this is the first one, I'm going to also cover some stuff, some stuff too for people who haven't seen TM before too. Okay, so I'll start with an introduction um, and just give an idea of what the TM is just to cover the basics there. And then I'm going to dive into a couple of different topics. So we'll talk about electron diffraction. Um, then we'll talk about a technique that I do a lot, which is called scanning transmission electron microscopy. Um, and then we'll go into some like slightly more niche uh, topics. So we'll start talking about some in situ work and then some analytical techniques at the end if we have time. So I threw this slide up to start with just to kind of give an overview of kind of the length scales we can see in electron microscopy. Tim gave a talk kind of a few weeks ago now about scanning electron microscopy. That's one type of electron microscopy. And I'm going to be talking about transmission electron microscopy. But those together can cover like the length scales from like one angstrong up to one millimeter. So it's quite a broad range. Um, I think Arthur's going to give a talk on uh, optical microscopy later in the seminar series. Um, so you can see that there's a lot of overlap. And a lot of people, if they've got questions they want to ask, will use a combination of techniques to address them, depending on the length scales of the questions they're asking. So uh, what is a TM? So um, a very basic level, a TM is a way to take images of your sample at very, very high magnification. And the T in the TM stands for transmission. So that means that the beam is passing through the sample. Um, we can, as I just showed, we've got a whole variety of different length scales um, we can study. So that makes it useful for a whole bunch of different applications. Um, so I today am going to concentrate more on the materials side because I'm a physics PhD. Um, but I think in two weeks time, we're going to have the lovely Nikki here is going to give a talk on more bio applications. So stay tuned for that. So this is a slide that Tim actually threw up a couple of weeks ago now. And uh, it's a nice comparison of the different microscopes that we, we typically think of using here. Um, and they all have some common features. So they all have um, like a source. They all have your sample, they have a bunch of lenses, and then you're gonna form an image and have some kind of detection mechanism. So uh, if we compare maybe the scanning electron microscope, you've got an electron gun at the top here, you've got lenses here, you've then got more lenses, and then it's focused down onto your sample, and then you've got a bunch of detectors. What's shown there is an everhart thornley detector, but you've got other detectors which are available to detect the signal that's coming off of it. In a TM, slightly different to that, we put the sample halfway up the microscope. So we've got lenses above the microscope and lenses underneath the microscope. And then we've got our detector at the bottom there. Um, because it's a transmission experiment, um, the images tend to look a lot flatter than you get with the other techniques because the beam is going straight through it. So this is a typical TM image. This is a graphene. Um, so you're seeing individual atoms there. Um, and then on the right here, you can see more topography in the SEM and the optical microscope. So how do you choose which technique you wanna use? Well, that depends on the questions you're trying to ask, right? So this is a nice example of something that we've all come encountered to, sea salt. 
And if your question is how big are the grains of the crystal? Well, you might want to go for SEM because this scale bar here is like 500 microns. So that's way too big that we're going to be using in a TEM. Um, so you could use SEM to really study these crystals, study some of the, the texturing of these crystals, like the example shown here. But if what you want to see instead is more on the atomic scale and you want to understand maybe the spacing between atomic rows, then you're going to go to something like TEM because it's just got that higher magnification and the higher resolution than you have in SEM. So if your question is, what's the, what's the crystal structure of the material, the TEM is the way to go. So uh, wouldn't be me without putting up a ray diagram. Uh, uh, so uh, the key difference between, well, one of the key differences between SEM and TEM is that in TEM mode, we have a parallel beam of uh, electrons which are hitting the sample. Um, in an SEM, you have a focus beam which you raster across the sample. So what we're doing here is we've got this parallel beam of electrons goes through the sample, interacts with the sample, and electrons can either go straight through the sample, which are these straight lines down here, or they can be elastically scattered, which come out at certain angles. And we'll come on more to that. Then we have a lens, which focuses these so that places from very um, electrons, which interact with different parts of the specimen are formed in an image plane. So up here, they're all focused down to here, up here, they're all focused down to here. And so therefore we have an image and that's what we're gonna take away and we're gonna analyze. So in order to do this, uh, the samples need to be thin enough to get the electron beam through it. So that's definitely a criteria for TEM that we don't have in SEM. Um, and we spend a lot of time um, when we're setting up the microscope, making sure the alignment is as good as possible so that we can get as good an image as possible. So what kind of things can go wrong and what could stop us from getting a good image? Well, one thing is astigmatism. Um, if you've done SEM before, you would have come across this too in an SEM focus the image and then you knock it off a of focus, you see some streaking, go back to focus and then you try to tune it up that way. Um, in a TM, we need to be a little bit more specific because we're going to higher resolution. So we use a technique um, which is to, to do a fast Fourier transform of the image. So we take an amorphous area and that is isotropic, it's the same way, same in all different directions. And so therefore, if we look at the average spacings between these features, um, they're gonna be radially symmetric. So this is what a nice FFT looks like. And then if we've got astigmation, we see that we get some stretching like here and here. Um, and then in the image, it's not the best example, but you can see that it's kind of brighter up here than in here. So we're seeing a non-uniformity of the image and that's just an aberration that we can correct for. Other aberrations we have are um, chromatic and spherical aberration. These are a little bit harder to correct for, um, but we do have ways to around that. So chromatic aberration is because the uh, source of electrons it is at a certain energy, but there's a certain energy spread to it. No electron gun is perfect. And so the electrons are going through lenses, and if an electron is moving fast, slightly faster or slightly slower, it's going to be deflected a different amount. And so that means we get a spread of how the lenses are coming out of the angle, a spread of angles that the electrons are coming out of the lenses. And obviously that's going to make it harder to focus. So this is an example of a chromatically aberrated image. Another thing that happens is that the lenses are not perfect. And sometimes rays which are going further out in the, the lens are not focused to the same spot as rays that are going closer in. And that we call spherical aberration. That's one that we can do something about on some of our microscopes. Basically, if you spend enough money, you can compensate for this. Um, and the way we do that is we add in a load of compensatory um, lenses. So if you've seen some of our microscopes, maybe be on a tour of our facility, you see that some of the microscopes are actually really, really tall. And that's because they've got these extra lenses, which their job is you measure the aberrations and then you counter that with these lenses. And this development, um, which happened in the like early 2000s, um, really has increased the resolution of our microscopes now and has really dramatically increased the resolution. So we are a, a very TM rich facility. Uh, we currently have six 
transmission electron microscopes. And uh, more information, I'm going to do a plug, is on the CNS website. Um, but yeah, we have the Joel 2100 is our oldest instrument. Um, this is primarily used material stuff. So is the Joel F200 and the Joel ARM. And then we also have uh, the Hitachi Megascope, which is more used for more niche applications. Um, and then Nikki is going to talk about probably the Hitachi 7800 next week. Um, There's a microscope that she looks after. And also we're just getting back up and running our Arctica, which has cryo-TM for biological applications. All right, so that was the introduction. Now on to some electron diffraction. Okay, so this is the diagram I put up at the beginning. And what I said was that uh, electrons which come from one place are focused down to one point on the image and that's how we form the image. Well, there is a magical point in the diffraction pattern, which, sorry, in, in this ray diagram, which is right here. And what happens here is that Electrons which are forward scattered are all focused into the middle. Those which are elastically scattered at one angle are all focused to the same point. And so this is actually going to give us information about the angles that the electrons are scattered at. How would we actually kind of see this guy rather than the image? Well, it's actually really easy. All we have to do is press a button. And that button, all it does is it changes the strength of one of the lenses here so that instead of projecting the image onto the screen, we're now projecting the diffraction pattern. So why do we get a diffraction pattern would be a good question to ask next. It's great that you can do it, but what, what does it mean and where does it come from? Well, a lot of materials have order to them, right? Crystallography. We've got different types of unit cells. And what we might want to know is what the unit cell is or what the spacing is between the, the, the different unit cells in the material. So if we've got an ordered sample, and this is a two-dimensional drawing of that, what you can do is you can have electrons coming in, interacting and scattering with the material and coming out. And if this length here plus this length here is equal to this, sorry, this length here is equal to d sine theta, where theta is the angle there, because that's the same as this angle here, and then this is d up here. So you can measure this angle here. Um, so if that, for in order to get positive interference, then you need to meet this criteria here, where this 2d sine theta is equal to an integer, which is usually one, times the wavelength of the material. And this we call Bragg's law. So we can use Bragg's law um, if we measure the angles which are coming out of the sample to then, and we know the wavelength of the microscope because we can look it up on this table, um, then we can figure out this despacing, which is something we're looking to figure out when we do um, electron diffraction. Here are some examples of what diffraction patterns look like. So uh, the easiest one to understand is probably this one over here on the left. This is a single crystal of material called strontium titanate, which you can hear me talk about a lot in this talk. Um, so what we see are a series of dots, um, and those dots are because of the magical angles that I explained on the previous slide. Um, it's in two dimensions because the crystal is in two dimensions as you're looking at it. So we can measure the spacing between these dots, and then that gives us the despacing of the, the, the reflection. Um, Sometimes we don't just have a single crystal. What we have are lots of different grains on our sample, all of different orientations. And then we get a polycrystalline diffraction pattern, which looks like this. So this is rings, and it's rings because the orientations are very, very uh, uh, basically continuous in the sample. And so you've got a different orientations, which give rise to a disk here. And again, we can index that, and we can figure out what the different D spacings are here. So that's of gold. And then the last example um, basically looks a lot fuzzier. And the reason it looks funny, fuzzier is because this is an amorphous sample. Um, in an amorphous sample, you don't have the rigid crystal structure, um, but you do have average separations of, of your atoms. So that gives rise to this kind of fuzzier in nature. So if you see something like this, it's amorphous. See something like this, it's polycrystalline. One application of diffraction work is a technique called bright field, dark field imaging. Uh, so what we've got on the left is a typical TEM image. This is of barium titanate nanoparticles. 
and down on the bottom here, we've got our diffraction pattern. And again, this is polycrystalline because all the different particles have different orientations. What we can do is we can apply a mask, which we call an aperture, over one part of the diffraction pattern. And then the only electrons that get through it are those which have been scattered at that magical angle. And that allows us to get an image like this, which is called a dark field image, where some of the electrons, sorry, some of the particles look bright, and that's because they are scattering at the angle that we selected. So this is a useful technique for sometimes doing like defects and stuff like that. All right, on to STEM, my technique. Um, <laughs> we already talked about what TEM is. As a recap, we've got a parallel beam of electrons hitting the sample. We form an image under the bottom. STEM is actually moving more towards what a SEM does. So what we do here is we focus the beam into a very sharp spot. And importantly, it's a smaller spot than you have in an SEM. And then you put it in one position on the scan. You measure the detector. You move to the next position on the scan. You measure the detector and so on. And that allows you to build up an image this way. So it takes longer to acquire a STEM image because you go to go point to point to point to point to point. Um, but there are some advantages, for example, elemental mapping, which I'll come on to later. Okay, so how do we detect the signal would be a good question to ask. And traditionally, what we do is we have a series of either ADF, which are annular dark field detectors, or bright field detectors. So the beam is coming down through the sample. We've already said it can be elastically scattered out at different angles. So if it's scattered out at a high angle, we might use conditions which would be called HADAF, which is high angle annular dark field, um, lower an angular dark field here, or the straight transmitter being the 000 beam would be this bright field here. Uh, the nice thing about the annular dark field detectors is that they are a ring with a hole in them. So you can actually use them simultaneously if you put a bright field detector underneath it, because the stuff that goes through the hole can still hit the bright field detector. So you can collect these simultaneously. Um, and another thing I just wanted to point out um, is that actually another advantage of STEM over TM is it gives slightly better resolution. Um, so not only can you do elemental mapping, but if you're really trying to get high, high resolution, then STEM might be the technique for you. This is an example of what a HADAF STEM image looks like. This is gallium dumbbells. And it says here, the separation is 63 picometers. So that's really, really, really small. Um, and we can see here, we've got these kind of two bumps. These we call dumbbells. And we can see there's a little gap in between them. And that's the 63 picometers. So that's us kind of showing off of the kind of resolution we can achieve. Um, if you've got a HADAF signal, the stronger the scatterer, or the more scatterers, the stronger the intensity. So when you're on the atomic position, it looks bright. When you're off the atomic position, it looks dark. There's less stuff there to create these um, high angles scattered electrons. Um, if you uh, increase your atomic number, you're going to get an even brighter signal because um, there's more scattering between the electron and the nucleus. Um, or if you have um, a thicker sample, you've got more chance of scattering too. Um, to a first approximation, the intensity does scale with the atomic number squared, but that's kind of a rough approximation. So comparing what a TM image looks like to a STEM image. So this is gold nanoparticles. Everyone who does TM in our labs starts off by doing some gold nanoparticles. Um, so we've got a TM on the image on the left. Uh, you can see, hopefully, maybe um, some, some crystal structure here, these like... Uh, planes, these lines, these are the atomic rows, columns. And then if we've got the HADAF, sorry, yeah, annular dark field detect image here, and then a bright field image over here. And because the electrons that aren't used for the annular dark field image go through the middle of the detector and get land on the bright field detector, these are gonna be inverse of each other. That's why this one looks bright here and it looks dark over here. And at the beginning, I was talking about uh, aberrations. So one thing we can do is we can compare what looks like uh, an image without aberration correction and image with. So this is similar sample that gives dumbbells, in this case, silicon. And we can see that on the right-hand side, the aberration corrector does give us a little bit better resolution. These dumbbells are a little bit clearer and we've got better contrast. 
But to be honest, I'm super impressed with this image on the left. This is without an aberration corrector. I really haven't seen a STEM image look like this good from a non-corrected system. So as a plug, if you're not looking for really, really high resolution, like these tiny little gaps here, the F200, which is over here in Alston, is a really great tool and is something that you, you should consider looking at. And you want to see Mr. Mr. Adam Graham in the corner there for more information. All right, moving on to some in situ. So sometimes we actually want to more create a real experiment in, this, in the TEM rather than just looking at a static sample. We want to see how it, observe how it changes under certain changing conditions. And so we have a variety of different tool, um, techniques we can do and different holders that we can use for doing that. So on the top left here is a heating holder. So we can heat samples up to 1100 degrees C inside the microscope, which is pretty damn hot. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing to do. We can also cool the sample. So we have this cooling holder here. This is liquid nitrogen. I'm going to show an example of liquid helium in a bit. Um, this is a new holder that we've just purchased. We're actually getting it uh, trained and installed on Friday this week. So brand new. Um, so this is another cooling holder. But another thing it can do is it can retract the sample inside it and make an air-free seal. So you can use, uh, if you've got a sample which is air sensitive, you can use it on this holder. And then I'm gonna show a little video on uh, our liquid, new liquid cell, which is another cool toy. What we have here is a movie. Um, so this is an in-situ movie where we're heating up our sample. This is some work Austin and I have been doing. And what we see happening is we see changes to the sample that we wouldn't otherwise have known were going to happen if we just looked at it in room temperature. So we're seeing these little dots appear. These are gallium beads, um, which leach out of the fib prepared material. And then they disappear as they hit a certain temperature. And then we see some edge pits forming there. So it's a really nice way to get a really great idea of what's happening in real space on your sample. Um, and we got an advert for the company who we were using for it. I should have edited that out of the video. Um, but that company actually have quite a cool thing. And they call that Axon, which is a silly name. But what it does is it takes control of the microscope and tries to improve your in situ imaging. Mm -hmm. So the when you cool something down or when you heat it up, it's going to expand or contract. Um, if you're cooling something, you can get vibrations from the uh the, the 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 coolant be it helium or um nitrogen bubbling off and so that kind of wreck, wrecks your images so what they do is they uh they drift correct um they image shift the the beam so that you're actually keeping the image really stationary so if you see on the left hand side there the image was moving around a lot that's the raw image and then on the right hand side on that monitor there that's the stationary image. So it's actually really impressive it can do that on these kind of length scales. Um, this is a picture of our liquid helium holder and that can get down to about 20, 22 Kelvin. Uh, another thing we can do is we can look at liquid samples and we were discussing this over at lunchtime. Uh, so the idea here is to allow people to be able to image things in the hydrated state. Normally, that's very challenging because when you put something in vacuum, you lose all of that water um, and you destroy the structure. So what this does is, uh, this company does, is they have graphene encapsulation. So they get a thin layer of graphene on a TM grid. You put a droplet of your sample on top, and then you put another layer of graphene on top to make a sandwich. You wick away the, the, the excess liquid, and then you've got the... the sample all enclosed nicely within a blanket of graphene. So up here, what we have is an SEM image of some yeast, which Austin and David took. Um, so you can see they're all looking very nice. And then we can also observe them in the TEM over here. And this is a video where you can see the, the equipment in motion. So it's picking up some graphene. We just drop cast our little solution. And over goes the, the robot there, which is just going to drop on our, our lid of graphene. All neatly done. And it works perfectly like that every time. Just don't ask Austin. 
Austin is the person you want to contact if you want to use that. Okay, so now we're going to move on to some different analytical techniques. So in Tim's talk, he talked about how you've got um, different signals coming off in the electron microscope while in an SEM that happens and so does it in a TEM. So we've got our incident beam coming down here. We can generate secondary electrons. We can generate backscattered electrons. And if you do SEM, you're very used to looking at those kind of signals. Um, you can also generate characteristic X-rays for a, a technique we call EDS, which I'll come on to in a couple of slides. Um, we can generate light, which is cathodoluminescence, uh, generate OJ electrons. Uh, we can also look at the direct beam, which is what we were doing in TM. And in diffraction, we were looking at elastically scattered electrons. But sometimes the electrons with their interaction with the sample lose energy. So you get inelastically scattered electrons. And those can sometimes be really interesting too. All right, so TM, uh, sorry, um, EDS is something that Tim talked about. Um, you can do EDS in a TEM as well as an SEM. So the detector geometry is a little bit different. Uh, what you do is you bring the detector in as close as you can to the sample, but you're constrained by how close you can get it because of the, the microscope's pull pieces. So you also have a collimator there, which tries to aim at the sample. Unfortunately, you can also get x-rays coming off the pole piece, so you get these system peaks coming from different parts of the, the sample. Um, and you can also get uh, system peaks from the grid itself. But it does mean you can get the information, and the advantage of this in the TM is that you've got much higher spatial resolution. So uh, just as a recap, uh, for EDS, incoming electron knocks out a core shell electron, and then that's unstable, so then an out electron falls down, um, and when it does that, it needs to give off energy, so it does that in the form of an X-ray. Uh, next up, uh, this is the same diagram here, um, but the idea is that depending on what, what shell the electron is knocked out of, um, you can have different combination of electrons from the outer shells which can drop down into it, and those are represented here, so if you I knock out the innermost shell, it's a K, then the next one out is an L and then an M. And so we can label these. And so this allows us to, these all have different energies and this allows us to fingerprint um, what, what material we have. So we get a family of K, L and M peaks. Now, most things in a TM are more complicated than an SEM, but somehow EDS is simpler, which is quite nice. Um, so because you've got a thin sample, you don't get all of the reabsorption and the fluorescence effects that you have when you're in a, in a T, sorry, an SEM where you have that big volume of interaction. The sample is thin, and so you can kind of ignore those effects. Um, so that means quantification is actually just limited to this equation here. So you can work out the concentration of elements just by working out the peak, measuring the peak intensities of that element. And then we've got a factor here, which we can look up. So it's actually much easier to quantify. Having said that though, the downside is because you've got a thin sample, you've got a lot less material. And so your signal is less. So, okay, it's easier to quantify, but you've got noisier data. So I don't know where you kind of gain there or not. It depends on your application and the question you're trying to ask. For example, um, this is kind of a like the highest resolution EDS you can do. You can actually see individual atoms. There's no way Tim could do that on an SEM. Um, so in a TEM though, if your microscope is behaving and you have the right detection, um, then in some cases you can even detect what elements are coming from which atom in the image. So I think this is kind of impressive. Um, so that gives you an idea of what length scale you can go down to. More typically, people are using this for nanoparticles on like the 10 to 100 nanometer scale in our labs. Um, but this, this is actually possible in some cases. Okay, uh, so another technique I'd like to talk about is EELS, electron energy loss spectroscopy. When I had the diagram up of the different uh, mechanisms or the different interactions, uh, I said that we can get inelastically scattered electrons. So for example, if the, uh, for making the X-ray for EDS, the incoming electron has a certain energy, 
it interacts with the sound pole and knocks out the core shell, then that loop makes it lose some energy. And so if we collect that and measure its energy, we can also tell that that excitation occurred. So uh, this can be really useful for uh, determining elemental mapping, just like EDS. It's a little bit harder and the signal is a little bit lower, but for lighter elements, it's actually the better way to go. Um, then we can also measure things like the oxidation state of the material, which is something we can't do in EDS. You can measure the sample thickness, which is quite nice. And I put here, yeah, you can also study any kind of other interactions the beam might have with your sample, for example, plasmons. So how does an eels spectrum look like? Well, this is a cartoon of it. So what we've got here is, is actually kind of one graph that we've blown up the, the tail down here because you wouldn't be able to see it by 10 times on the right-hand side here. So you've got your zero loss peak. This is electrons who have just traveled straight through the sample and not interacted with the sample. So they have not lost any energy. So you're always going to get some of those unless you've got a ridiculously thick sample, in which case you're not, you shouldn't be doing TEM on it. Uh, then you've got some low loss um, excitations, which happen like below 50 EV. And then if you go out higher in energy for each element you've got in the material, you're going to start to see those K, L, and M um, transitions that we saw in the EDS. We call them edges because it comes down and then it goes up again uh, in eels. And that has some fine structure, which we'll come into shortly. And also you just got an extra signal there superimposed on this background. So if we integrate under that, we can get an idea of what the uh, amount of that material is. We've got uh, a nice kind of website is this eels.info, which gives you why the edges are for each material and what the, the shape of the edge looks like. So that's quite a handy reference. It also has reference spectra that you can download and, and play with and compare it to your samples. So back to what is, I guess, fast becoming my favorite material, strontium titanate. So we already met uh, HADAF images. This is a HADAF image of a sample here. But with eels, uh, this is some data we took here, um, you can also map out what elements in this, this map here are strontium, what's titanium, and what's oxygen. So very, very high spatial resolution. It's higher spatial resolution than EDS. So we tend to use it if we're trying to do elemental mapping and you can get some nice information about your local crystal structure or any defects which are going on in it. I said earlier, you can look at oxidation state. So what you would do is you would blow up, uh, expand into the spectrum, and then you look at very fine changes in it. So this is a nice example of some eels on the left-hand side compared to X-ray absorption spectroscopy that some of you may be familiar with. That's another way to find out the oxidation state of a material. And because the mechanisms are the same, you get the very similar line shapes. So what we usually do is we'll measure our sample and we'll have a couple of references where we know the oxidation state and we'll plot them all out and then we'll decide which one is, is closer. You can also look and see where the edges start, which is where this peak here is and the ratio of the different peaks to each other. So up here, there's a, like this one is closer to this one. Up here, this one is much larger than this one. So we use features like that to try and help us identify what the oxidation state is. And again, we can map this. So that's kind of fun too. The easiest way to use eels is just to figure out the sample thickness. And this is something that we do sometimes. Um, and I'll come on to an example of why we want to do that later. But what we do here is we've got the electrons which go all the way through it and the electrons which somehow interact. And by another ratio of those, we can figure out the thickness because the more interactions we have, that indicates the, the thicker the sample, right? So we've got this nice relationship here where T is the thickness and lambda is in this case, the mean free path is not the wavelength, it's the mean free path of the electrons at that condition. So that varies depending on uh, the energy or the material that you're looking at and the angle that you're using for collection. But fortunately for common materials, um, you can look those up in uh, tables, which is quite nice. All right, onto the last section, doing good on time. So uh, electron tomography, there's a couple of slides on this. So this is another technique, which we're just kind of ramping up here. Um, on the F200. 
So um, Adam is the person to see for this. The idea here is that when we take a TM image, it looks very flat, as I said at the very beginning. Um, and sometimes we want to see more of a 3D model. So is what the feature we're seeing at the top or the bottom of the sample. Um, so the way we would do that is similar to what Greg talked about a few weeks ago with his micro CT lecture. Um, so what we do is we take the sample, we look at it at zero degree tilt, but then we just keep rotating it gently in the beam and taking an image at every rotation. So this is very similar to how the micro CT worked. And then we use reconstruction to try to generate more of a 3D model here. So this is gold stem image here. You can do it in stem mode or TEM mode this technique. And then if you take a tilt series, then you can reconstruct it. Then you can see more of the three-dimensional structure of it. Uh, this is an example that was done in the Eisenberg group. Uh, so at the top here, we have a TM image of um, some gold palladium nanoparticles on a silica support. These are used as catalysts. And what they wanted to see was when they're on the support, how deep are they embedded into the support? Are they sitting right on the surface? Are they sitting partly submerged onto the surface? Because that's going to affect their catalytic performance. So what they did was they found a bunch of these particles and they did tomography on it. And you can see the reconstruction here where the yellow is embedded and the green is the exposed surface. And then they were able to get some statistics on how, when, how deeply these particles were buried in their material and helped to better understand what's going on with these catalysts. Okay, and then lastly, my new pet project, which is 4D STEM. Um, so we talked earlier in STEM mode about how you have these different detectors. You have your HADAF detector, you have your bright field detector. And I was saying, yeah, it's great because you can collect these simultaneously. That's great, but you only get two signals out. Um, and sometimes we need to know a little bit more information or we might like to. So what we're doing now, and this is a very new technique, only the last few years, is instead of having these detectors sitting there in the beam path, we instead put in a direct electron detector. So this is a pixelated detector. So we can therefore get the signal at every pixel in this two-dimensional detector. Um, in STEM, what we're doing is we're actually collecting a, a diffraction pattern. I explained earlier that some of the electrons are, are coming out one direction from elastically scattered, some are going straight down. Well, here, we're, that's what we're seeing. And then we're able to get a diffraction pattern at every point on the scan. So we get the huge data set, um, but it's very, very rich. So why is this a new, new thing? Why haven't we been doing this since day one? Because we could already imagine that we want this. Well, the answer to that is that detectors just weren't good enough to do what we would need to do. So regular CCD, which looks like this, where you've got a scintillator and it's coupled down onto the detector, um, those are very slow frame rates. So about 60 frames per second. So if we were wanting to collect a, a data set that was very large, it's going to take a very, very long amount of time, like an hour. And if it takes an hour to collect a data set, then the sample is probably going to move in that time, which isn't very good. You're also exposing your sample to the beam for a long period of time so you can damage it. So that didn't really work out. So now what they've developed are these direct electron detectors, which are much more sensitive. And the key is they're also much faster. So we're going from 60 frames per second to 4,200 frames per second. So two orders of magnitude faster. And this is a complete game changer for this, for this technology. So the idea now is we can collect a data set in more like 15 to 30 seconds. So your sample isn't gonna drift as much during that and you're not overexposing your sample. So that's kind of nice. So once we've got the data set, and again, this is a, a diffraction pattern basically, where instead of spots, we've got disks because it's in STEM mode. Um, what we can do is we can then just collect data which comes from certain pixels of each data set. So we can apply virtual masks and we can position these however we like. And here are some examples. So if we put a, a mask over just the bright disk, then we're going to have a bright field image. And then we have what looks like a bright field stem image of strontium titanate. If we go around the outside, then that's the elastically scattered electrons. So we've got the annular dark field. And so the atoms are now looking bright again. And there's another technique, which I didn't cover, um, which is if you just use the outer ring of the bright field mask, and this is particularly sensitive to oxygen atoms. Um, so this is 
going to show us kind of where the, the lighter elements are in your material. And so you can get this mask here. Um, so these are, I'm just going to do a little showing off here, that these are the published data, and this is my data. Uh, another application um, is you've got the diffraction pattern. While we talked earlier about the despacings and how we can use that to identify um, what the material is. So in this example, which was done by a group at Dartmouth, they have these tin particles and it can have alpha phase or beta phase phase tin. And those each have different sets of despacings. So what we could do is we could do some bright field, sorry, some dark field conventional TM imaging, but we don't get a very rich data set there. So what we've done is we've collected the diffraction point at every point in this map here. And then we analyzed it and we measured the despacings, as you can see at the bottom, some examples there. And we're able to tell at each pixel whether we have alpha phase or beta phase or a mixture of the two. So we're able to generate this map here where alpha phase is in red and beta phase is in blue. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. I've been talking about how the electron beam interacts with the sample. Well, what if the sample has got an inbuilt field or a crystal structure, which is going to deflect the beam? So if you've got a local electric field or you've got a magnetic field within your sample, the electrons negatively charged are going to be moved within the, the deflected within the sample. So what we can see is if that occurs, we get a change of the center of mass. And these detectors are very nice and sensitive, and we can detect these subtle shifts. So we can do that on different length scales. So back to my favorite, strontium titanate. So this is the Hadoff stem image. And what we can do is we can zoom in to some of these uh, atoms, and we can take a very high resolution map, and we get something like on the right-hand side here. So the arrows represent the direction of the electron shift, and the um, color represents the magnitude. So we can see around each of the atomic positions, we have a field where the electrons are getting attracted to the nucleus, and they're coming inwards. So that's kind of fun. So then we decided, Austin and I, that we needed a way to quantify this and make sure that we're able to actually measure a realistic electric field. And that's what's going on here. So we took a sample which Austin has very well characterized on the atom probe and a bunch of other people who characterized on the atom probe, where we knew the doping levels. So we've got a junction here, which is phosphorus doped uh, next to epi silicon. Um, so there should be a voltage drop across this, a uh, voltage across this gap here. Um, and we can calculate what that would be um, just by knowing the doping levels, which is given right here. Um, so we took that sample and thought, okay, well, what do we measure and how does that compare? So we took our data sets, which looks like this. We took our average um, pack bed, which is position average seabed pattern. So it's just a sum of all our data. And we, we masked it so that we just did a little ring around the outside. And we said for each data set, each piece of data, what, how does that disk move? And so we got a map which looked like this. And we were able to calibrate it from Maxwell's equation by looking at the angular shift of the beam. We can therefore figure out the electron, sorry, the energy, um, sorry, not energy, electric field, um, that, that caused the shift. And so we can map the electric field like this. And we see this nice bright line at the interface. So here is a, a line scan taken down here of this plot. And we can see a nice peak here. And the maximum uh, electric field strength was uh, just under one megavolt per centimeter. And our measured uh, voltage drop was 0.719 volts. And the theoretical was 0.662. So I need to put some error bars on here clearly. Um, but that's actually pretty good um, for this kind of measurement, especially as this is a very small shift that we observed. OK. So uh, in summary, I hope I've whet your appetite for some of the various stuff we can do in our TEMs here at CNS. Um, if you are interested in any of these techniques, please send me an email or send Adam an email um, if it's one of the things I mentioned that was over here. And I'm ready to take any questions. <laughs>